Time to talk about solver tank repair in the second world war. Now since this is a rather niche topic and also falls under the dreaded L category, namely logistics, the source situation is not the best. And speaking of sources and tanks, if you want to get your hands on a German Panzer Company manual from 1941 in German and English, be sure to check out our Indiegogo campaign. To do the high demand, we added another 50 signed copies with worldwide shipping to the campaign. Now let's first address the question on why we need repair for tanks. The answer to this question might seem rather obvious, yet depending on your understanding of World War II tanks, you might be quite surprised. First off is the vulnerability. Although these steel beasts seemed quite strong at times, they were quite weak in other areas, namely when it came to reliability and many other technical issues, as Dixon points out. While it may not be obvious to the infantryman cowering in his foxhole as the tank approaches, tanks have vulnerable things, often operating at the limit of their engines and transmissions capabilities, and it doesn't take much to put them out of service. The tank is basically threatened by several factors, its own design, its construction, its crew, logistics, and only then by the enemy. Where there is a certain interaction going on, for instance a tank designed with minimal margins for error or on the limits of its capabilities is more likely to break if there are any problems with the construction process or materials. Furthermore, if the crew makes any errors, it is even more likely. For instance, a novice driver can easily throw off a track or if the turret is not properly turned while crossing a ditch, the gun barrel can be damaged. Additionally, the large weight climatic situation and terrain wear down a tank rather easily as well. Remember, these vehicles were not produced with modern factories. So if the crew does not regularly maintain the tank or does not receive the proper spare parts and or lubricants, the chances of failure increase again. This is also clearly reflected by this observation. Tank losses due to technical reasons increased in percentage after an operation lasted for more than approximately 20 days, illustrating a need for constant maintenance on even operable tanks. Well, finally, there's of course the obvious threat to tanks, the enemy, yet even here one has to think a bit differently than usually. And even an obsolete anti-tank gun can damage the running gear, jam the turret or damage the cannon with a lucky or skillful hit. Remember, tanks on the battlefield will likely draw more fire than smaller or less threatening targets. Yet one might argue, well, why not just replace damaged or destroyed tanks with new ones from the factory? Well, this was an option before and after an ongoing operation, yet usually not during an operation. In the last war, reinforcements of armored units with new combat vehicles either in groups or individually took place mainly while preparing for operations or during long operational pauses. Reinforcements from factories happen very seldom during battle. Therefore, repair of damaged armored vehicles during an operation and their quick return to service was the most important, even the sole source of battlefield replacements. Of course, this was for the Red Army. Now, when it comes to losses, kills, etc., it is always very important to remember what the terminology actually means, especially since there is usually quite some variation between the different factions. For instance, the Soviets used the term irrecoverable. I'm not going to pronounce that, to refer to losses, in both personnel and equipment, which were permanently lost. In personal losses, it includes dead and missing. The author of the paper that serves as the main source notes about his use of knocked out. In this study, knocked out refers to damage, repairable or not, which puts a tank out of action. Now this is very important, since a tank that was knocked out could be repaired and see action again. So it was possible that during an operation, more tanks were lost then they were totally fielded. For a long operation, the number of knocked out tanks could be double or triple the number of tanks at the start, as some tanks were knocked out two, three or even four times. A tank army with an average of 600 tanks at the start of an operation that suffered an average of 32 tanks lost per day would have no tanks left after only 19 days, if there were no compensating factors. Now what of course is particularly interesting is the rate at which tanks were repaired once they were knocked out. So the tank repair rate is the number of tanks which were repaired each day. Tank repair rate is influenced by many factors. The severity of the fighting and therefore the number of tanks in need of repair. The speed at which a site is advancing, which increases the distance between the damaged tanks and the repair units. The availability of evacuation vehicles, how long repair units can remain in one place, etc. 
Second, the quality of tanks increased as the war went on. Improved tanks lasted longer before requiring overhaul or suffering a malfunction. Yet there could be huge variations. For instance, Dixon gives the data for the 4th Guards tank army during the Sadomir Silesia operation. The average rate of 19 tanks per day, yet the minimum number of tanks repaired on a day were 0 and the maximum 68. Yet he looked at data for different units and operations and plotted the data. The increase from 1943 to 1945 is substantial, from the low 20s to the low 40s, and reflects the increase in tank repair units in the Red Army force structure. Now Dixon also has a case study about the 3rd Tank Army from late 1942 to early 1943. First, from 29th December 1942 to 14th January 1943, the army was deployed and had to cover a distance of about 400 km beeline or as the crow flies. The results were quite interesting. Of the 426 tanks which set out, only 304 arrived at the final destination. 122 tanks remained scattered along the route in various stages of disrepair due to technical reasons. Now, in terms of air recovery losses, they only started once the Soviets started the offensive. Yet, due to the repairs from recoverable tanks during the operation, the overall strength of the tanks could increase over time until the German counteroffensive happened. Suddenly, the irrecoverable losses went through the roof. The reason for the sudden increase in irrecoverable losses was probably due to the fact that damaged tanks, for the most part immobile and requiring a tall to go anywhere, were overrun by the advancing German forces. The case study is very interesting for many reasons. First, it shows how many tanks were actually lost during the march. Second, it shows that the number of tanks could increase during the battle, since the damaged tanks could be put into service again. Third, from the sudden spike in increase of irrecoverable losses, one can determine when certain pools or areas with damaged tanks were overrun or had to be abandoned. Now, before we move to the conclusion, Peter from Tank Archives has dug out something very interesting. The Soviet apparently also handed out rewards for the repair of tanks. To quote, Order of the People's Commissar of Defense on rewards of personal armored units for quick and high quality repair rates, number 0140, February 25th, 1942. In order to isolate repair and restoration of tanks currently undergoing light and medium repairs in army level, front level and military repair units I ordered at, number one, starting on March 1st, 1942, the following monetary reward for personnel of repair units that can provide quick and high quality repair of tanks in the timelines defined by the commanders is introduced. For the KV-1 tank, light repairs 350 rubles, medium repairs up to 800 rubles, T-34, Mark II or Mark III tanks, light repairs 250, medium repairs 500 rubles. For BT, T-26, T-40 or T-60 tanks, 100 rubles for light repairs and 200 for medium repairs. Sixth, for systematic overfulfillment of government quotas for tank repair, personnel of repair units are nominated by the military council for decorations in addition to this monetary reward. Seventh, this order must be announced to the personnel of the armored vehicle repair units and formations. People's Commissar of Defense, Josef Stalin. To conclude, Dixon draws four observations from his study. Number one, if the number of irrecoverable losses were limited, a tank unit could maintain or sometimes even increase the number of operational tanks during the course of an operation if enough could be repaired. Number two, the faster a tank unit advanced, the farther behind the repair units lagged and the more time they had to spend moving to keep up, both reduced the number of tanks which could be repaired. Number three, retreat could lead to a total loss of a lot of tanks if a damaged tank pool was overrun to the very low number of evacuation vehicles. Most tanks had to be abandoned. This is similar to the problems the Germans experienced in late war, especially with the heavy tanks. And number four, operational pauses were critical and allowed repair units time to catch up and clear backlog of tanks to be repaired. This and the fact that it did not retreat and lose its damaged tank pool is why the 5th Guards tank army was able to reconsolidate itself after the battle at Prokhorovka. Now, in case you'd like to learn more about tank warfare, Bismarck and I have translated a German army regulation about the medium tank company from May 1941, which builds upon the experience of the successful campaigns in Poland, the Low Countries and France. It encompasses topics such as tank crew specialization, training, formations, how to engage enemy positions and tanks. It is not a mere translation. It also comes with the German original text on one page and the English on the other. Additionally, we added notes and terminology 
translation decisions, a glossary and several other supplements as well. If you're interested, check out our Indiegogo campaign. If you like this video, consider supporting me by sharing this video or by other means. Also a big thank you here to the Buca Military History Park in Slovenia, the Panzermuseum Munster in Germany and the Tank Museum at Bovington in the United Kingdom for inviting me to hear the museums and events. Thank you to Peter for sending me various links on this topic. As always, source the list in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.